So this is one of the weird adjustments that we do. Uh, so there are five owners of Obsidian, and sometimes they work on products and sometimes they don't. If all five of them are not working on a product, then our man month rate is wrong. Because our man, then the man month rate for on our projects is trying to thank you guys because I realized I didn't say that part of this. Um, so backing up a bit on this is that this all works because I've negotiated a man month rate that makes us money. So if I've not negotiated a man month rate that makes us money, then this system doesn't work. And, and but when I do negotiate a man month rate that works, it allows this to work, it allows the team to not, they don't have to think about dollars, they just think about the man months. But we do have to make adjustments, like I said, for things that don't work exactly well. Because um, we're still a fairly small studio, so that when we're you know, at 100, 120 people, so five owners, which are more of a highly paid people, if they're not working on products, that actually then drives our overhead up, and so we have to deal with it in some fashion. So what we do in this case is we take a man month out of availability for the team. So in essence, so it just it gets taken off the top, so they don't actually get to use that man month. Um, there's a fair amount of arguments about that from time to time, but it's, it's the best way to work out to manage it. Um, and then what we do is we just provide an overview by RPG by year, by phase, uh, and by department. And this just gives everybody just a good idea at a very high level. This is what's going on with the project. This is what's going on with the tool. Um, uh, and so, so that again, we're not getting caught up in the dollars and cents. We're not getting caught up in, well, can I buy a computer? Can I do this? Can I do that? No, this is, we just, we just manage on the man on, 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 on basis. Um, so the next thing uh, that I found to be very helpful for us is to be focused. Uh, and what I mean by that for us is that we make role-playing games and we only make role-playing games. We don't make anything else. Uh, and what that does allow, uh, what that allows us to do is to be awesome at doing that, not good at a whole bunch of things. Uh, what I did kind of early on in running, in running the city is that I actually tried to sort of sell us as an, as an everyman developer. So we did Nitro Public too, uh, and then I was out on the road trying to get products. And what I, was, what I was doing is, oh no, we could make this kind of game, we could make that kind of game, and we could do this, and we could do that. Um, and suddenly what happened was, instead of being on this, oh, these guys make role-playing game lists, we went on to the, oh, they develop all this stuff list. And what, and what I mean so much by that is that when a publisher was looking for someone to make a certain kind of game, if they were just looking for game hacks or, or they, were, they weren't looking for a specific genre, they looked at a list of 50 developers. When they know we want to make a role-playing game that's either original or that uses a license, oh, we go to this list which has five people on it. So by, by focusing ourselves on something we already love to do, but that allows us to be great and allows us to be known for something, it got us on the short list of biz devs so that we would all we'd get lots of calls. On the flip side, it also meant we got fewer calls. <laughs> but every call we got had a much higher chance of actually, of actually going towards the product. And in essence, in, in a lot of the case, as a studio, we've turned down a lot of, uh, we've turned down um, a lot of different uh, products uh, just because of it. Um, but it also means that uh, it allows the focus just for your development efforts. So rather than trying to make an engine that can do everything, you can make a golf game, you can make a racing game, you can do this, you can do that, it allows you to make an engine and pipelines and processes and the way you run your company focused on one style of game. Making a Call of Duty is way different than, than, than making the following things. And, and by focusing that and focusing your people, every iteration of the product you can make, you can make it more efficient, you can make it bigger, bigger, you can, you, you can keep on moving forward. And so the focus is, has been very important to us as a studio. Um, tools not brute force. Uh, and this kind of just goes off what I was saying a little bit before. We put a lot of effort into tools. So I would say that if you, if you look at sort of our um, our, when it comes to like all of our programmers, so if we have 15 programmers in core tech, um, we, six of them are just focused on tools. So almost 50% of our tech group is focused on just tools. And what that means is that because it goes in line with this, I have this, this is a theory, it's a philosophy, I guess, is that, uh, is that if a junior employee, if I hire someone from a college and, and they go through the training on the engine and stuff like that, if they can make a ship level all by themselves because of the tools and pipelines um, that we've made, um, then we can make games a lot better. And we can make more content in our games. And I guess for us that's important because we make role playing games. There's an expect expectation of 60, 70, 80, 100 hours. But I think even in smaller games, 
Um, if you can, if you can, if it's as easy as possible for someone to make a level, it, it just it just makes the process much easier. And that kind of really ties into the next thing about this is sort of a philosophy that we really try to and really try to focus on, which is make a game like you make an expansion pack. Uh, and what I mean by that is that uh, if you've ever worked on an expansion pack or worked on a sequel, they're so much easier than making the first one. And because all everything's already working and everybody understands what they're doing, and in general it's because all the tools in the pipeline are finished. And so, and so what we try to do, this is sort of a mantra, we say if we get to the point where we're making levels as if we had finished the game, then the game is going to be a whole hell of a lot better. And, and so and a lot of that has to do with, with making sure that the tools allow, allow them to do that. Uh, and, and, and it ties into the really next thing up, because it lets you make games with less staff. And that's important to us. Uh, we're still an independent developer. Uh, we're, not, we're not a publisher that can put 300 people on a game. Um, there's still this real dichotomy that I said that some, some days I, I probably complain and I'm not more than I should, uh, in which a publisher will go spend 40, 50, 60, 70 million on an internally developed product. Um, but get trying to get more than 15, 20 million for an external product can be a big pain in the ass. It happens, like it is, and it's, it's not. It's, not, it's, not, it's just there is there, there is that strange difference. So we often have really have to look at efficiencies and look at few, using as few people, uh, using as few people as we can on our products. Um, and last, and, and the next, the last, the, the, or sorry, the next thing about standardization by making sure the tools are what is making the game. It's not just hand edited text files. It's not. Everything is unique. It forces standardization, which means that if every chest functions the same way as every single other chest in the game, when there's a bug in chests, you fix it once and fix it across the game. It means you have less bugs. The more unique stuff, which is often stuff that is not tool-driven, uh, can really lead to a ton of bugs, particularly for us because of role-playing games. Um, you know, we have 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 thousand bugs on a daily basis sometimes. And, um, and we really do fix them a lot of them. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, so it just, it, it, it just it's, the standardization really helps us. And what I think is the coolest thing about really focusing on tools and tight tools <coughs> is that, again, I can give this to a junior person and say, go nuts, if the box works great. Because they can go nuts and they can totally surprise me. They can go and like, wow, that level's freaking crazy. And they did it because it all works and they have the tools and then the tool to play around with and it will run in the engine. And, and again, when things are much looser, and it's kind of using XSI to do this, and using this other body to do that, and it, it ends up with a lot of sort of much more senior people have to do things in difficult ways just to get something else to run. So again, a sort of a, a focus on tools that standardize things can really that's have really helped us um, make our products. It's gonna sound like an odd thing. Um, I get asked I get asked a question about like. Uh, Sort of, uh, doing the original IP and why we do so many licensed products all the time. Um, I actually, you know, and I guess I'm jumping almost to the end, but uh, I really like making licensed products. I really enjoy playing other people's worlds. And personally, and, and that, doesn't, that doesn't mean that I don't ever want to make another original IP. I just think that's, that in some cases, a lot of people in the industry sort of think that an original IP is like the pinnacle achievement of your life and that, and that you can only be creative if you're working on original IP. And I, I can say I've had the most fun in my, you know, in my career make, uh, making licensed products. Now I've had a ton of fun. Fallout was amazing as well. I guess, it, I guess when I think of Fallout in that regard, I, I really look at it as a sort of a, a even playing field. But I have had amazing uh, fun playing, uh, making licensed games. Now, the creativity on an original IP is awesome. I have to admit that. It's great. You get to go over and you can, you can bend something. Uh, but, and the next thing, there is, there is no box. And because there's no box, all you, get, all you get for a long period of time is a lot of people arguing about what the box is. So unless, unless you know, so when we've gone through this, we, we've learned, when we do original IP, we have to have that central person who gets the box. And, and, can, and through pure force of will, force that box on everybody else. When we allow that, when we allow that period of time and product to be more socialistic and more democratic and more like, well, what do you want? Well, what do you want? And big meetings with 20 people in them. There is a point in time where that is important and people should get their, their opinion forward. But it, it, there has to be someone that comes in and just says, no, this is the box. All you need is shut up, in my opinion. 
Um, so the other thing I find really hard about virtual IP is, is dealing with publisher side. And is that while there is excitement about the original idea, the second they sign the contract, everybody has no right to make it the game. And, and this is just a challenge that we've gone through in all the original IP that we've done. And a lot of it is, and I'm not trying to make publishers scapegoats or make them sound bad. I worked with a publisher for a long time. So what it is is just that original IP is hard to understand for someone who's not a gamer. More, more non-gamers exist at publishers than exist at developers. A lot of people at a publisher are much more controlled by if they don't make their numbers, they're in trouble. And so and original IP is scary to them because they often can't also associate it with something known that made a lot of money. And the sales force in particular has a hard time because when they go to Walmart and say, buy a million units of this, they're going to like, what's it like? They're like, well, it's kind of like this, it's kind of like that, and it's kind of cool like this, like, like well, yeah, but it's not our own city. And so they, so what, so a lot of times we can really work through that. And what that means, ultimately, is that an incredible amount of time for us has been spent, or that we've learned to spend on our, on our products and we're doing the original IP, is constantly reselling our publisher and our internal team on the idea. So it sounds silly, but we actually have the product PowerPoint that we use to pitch the product. It goes through iterations. And then the team gets shown that PowerPoint every 60 days. Just every 60 days here. And I know, and a lot of times they're so bored to see it, but it reminds them what it's all about. We, and we also, with our publishers, we try to make a point of making it as easy as possible for them to understand the IP. We send them, we send them movies, we send them concepts. The big thing that we do in our milestone process because we know publishers are really busy. And so what we do is we, we make a short film, usually about 40 minutes, 40 to 60 minutes, that shows important things in the build we're sending, important pieces of concept art, and other kind of tonal or cool things about the, about the IP and the product. And we, and we do that for every single milestone. <coughs> and we know that if the producer is really busy, sometimes they get dragged off to do other stuff, that they can then just, so, so their boss is asking, well, what's going on with the milestone? They just send it the movie. And now that they can watch that movie for 40 minutes or, or you know, zip around it for 10. And, they, and what we've gotten in that case is we've gotten our ability to present what, how we feel the product is going. Because what we also do is add a video track to it. So our producer or product director goes through and explains things uh, in that movie. And that really has really helped us on our box. Because then there's sort of an understanding of, of a lot of cases, like there's some, something that's sort of stupid in the film. We know it looks stupid. But a lot of people can interpret that, well, why did they include that in the build thing? A lot of reasons why, but we can, the person who is doing the, the video track on it can actually say, Yes, the store doesn't work and it looks lame. We know that it's going to be in the next build. And we totally reduce sort of the tension uh, that can occur between us and our publisher. Uh, this is something we really refined over the last, I would say, year. Uh, it's gotten harder and harder to pitch big products. Um, last product we went out to pitch, uh, we were lucky for 20 to 30 million dollars for. Um, a lot of people don't want to give anybody 20 to 30 million dollars right now. So we, we felt, so we really said, okay, how are we going to go and do this? And so we ultimately came up with this sort of this uh, five, six type of things that we do. Obviously, there was a PowerPoint presentation. What we then did next to do was a tone movie, which is just lots of art, art that we can get our internal content artists to do, or that we have, we get off of Google, we have someone external do it, um, and we make it about two, two and a half minutes, we do it to some cool music. Um, and but it gets a very much a sense, very more quickly, of sort of what we're trying to say about our product um, in the presentation. Uh, we also do a source book, and that's my little that went right there. Right there. Um, this is something we did with our last product. It was really successful, uh, I, and people like it. Was it was silly after I explained this a little bit. So what we did is we wrote a kind of a higher, like a longer GDD, like a, like it's called high concept GDD, but it was still like 40, 50 pages. So I found this place called DocuCopy. Online and for eight dollars, you send them the PDF, and they send you back a nice glossy, perfect bound, nice hard kind of hard cardboard, nice paper printed out on both sides. It literally looks like a DMV source book, and they're eight dollars each. So, so I'm going into pitch thirty million dollar games with an eight dollar book, and everybody is sort of everyone's like, oh my god, that's the most amazing thing they've ever seen. And 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 just get it. It, I think it was, it was instrumental in helping us because it felt real. We went in and everything that we had with us just felt done and polished. Um, and ultimately though, what we did need to do to finally sell the last thing that we did 
if we didn't have to do a demo. And these are hard because this means putting people, this means spending money. Um, luckily, we do have an engine right now, so we ended up spending, I would say, about six weeks and probably four or five people for those six weeks to put a demo together, for a, sort of a walk around visual demo. And, the, and in that, what we just we try to do is make it look really good. We didn't focus on things like combat, we didn't focus on things like that. We just kind of showed, we had our tone movie, we had our concept art, and then we represented that in the demo. Um, basically, now here it is in 3D. Um, and all of that stuff packaged together, it, it, we, we were complimented, which I was very surprised. Um, we we publishers like, we're not going to sign you, but, <laughs> but we want to compliment you on everything that you brought. We thought it was awesome. We just, it just doesn't fit right now. Sorry, could you repeat that awesome website for the source book? Just repeat uh, that. DocuCopies.com. DocuCopies? DocuCopies.com. It was the cheapest place that I found, um, and they, they turned it around. Um, it took a little while to turn around, like 10 days, uh, but it, the, what, they, what they put together was awesome. Um, anyway, so, so uh, the next thing is practice, 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 practice. Um, it, it sucks to give that same presentation. You start feeling retarded. Give the same presentation over and over and over again. But you have to do it. Um, and what we try to do is we try to give it to the whole company. Um, because if we can try to sell them on it, uh, then we can sell them. Hopefully we can sell a publisher. If we can't sell them, there's no chance we're going to sell a publisher. Uh, and so we constantly refine it. Um, what I learned, what we, I learned recently to do was to make different versions. Um, and the 90 minute, that's really a question mark for us. Sometimes it's good for us to have a 90 minute version because we're often selling a world and selling this whole thing. So having a 90 minute version works for some publishers. Um, but we need the 15, 30, 45, 45, 60 minute versions because sometimes like I'll be in E3 and I get called and oh, Capcom wants to talk to you. Uh, the CEO of Japan is at 15 minutes. So if I haven't been able to give that PowerPoint in 15 minutes, I've never done it. And to be honest, that happened and I had not done the 15 minute version yet. And so I stumbled my way through 15 minutes um, and uh, I, I would say it's an okay presentation, certainly wasn't my best. Uh, and it's really important that the presentation has as much art in it as possible. People love art, people like to focus on it. Isn't it wonderful that I have a little number in there? You know, I mean, it's, it's very important. If you just have slides with text, it just doesn't help. But know that it doesn't need to be your art. It can be anybody's art, and you're just upfront about it. Like, whenever we get a proposal, we'd say, some of the art in here is art, and some of it is just stuff that I ripped off the board. I've never had a publisher go, oh, get out of here. You know, they don't care. They just, and the idea is it just gives them a sense of, of what they're thinking about. Um, and I think it's really important is to understand, like, know, know what the, that publisher or what publishers in general want with a proposal. Like, let's say a year ago, um, and it's still probably true a little bit to an to extent today, um, is that Microsoft is interested in giving publishers money to do Kinect stuff. So, Connect doesn't necessarily work great with our products. There are things that it can do, like vocal recognition and stuff like that. But I can go with a good sense of like, we want to go make an open world RPG, it's going to be connect. You know, like, that's, that's not going to work. But what we can say is, we're going to explore all of these connect features, voice recognition, some gestures, um, you know, and, and this kind of stuff. It had a whole slide on it. And for certain publishers, they were like, awesome, because they can see the dollar signs that they can get either in co-marketing or other kind of stuff from Microsoft. So it's really important to kind of consider what the publisher is into. And even when you're, if you're, if you're, if you're proposing it to the first parties, what are they into right now? Microsoft loves Avatar stuff. So can you make, how can you include Avatar stuff in your game? Uh, and things like that. Um, the next thing is, some people think it's kind of mean, but, um, so the first publishers you go and present to are not the ones that you either want to work with or you think are really even looking. They're your practice publishers. And so what you do, because by doing that, you learn more about what publishers are thinking right then, and, and you're just now you're really giving it. And it's amazing how much you can refine that by going through a number of publishers first uh, to really get to a point where you have the pitch even more solid. Um, so let's see, so the next thing, this is, this is a hard lesson um, that we're still learning, and that is we can think of ourselves as being the masters of knowing everything there is to know about making games, and that we are the smartest people on the face of the planet. Um, it says, I can't hear you over the sound of God having a um, And yeah, what I mean by that is it is that thing of, of, of being, of being uh, is you have to listen to other people, and you have to understand, or what, that's what we've learned, is that we really have to listen to the people that are going to buy our games. 
We have to understand what they expect from our games. Because it doesn't matter how a product is sold to them through advertising, whatever. If they know what an obsidian game is and we give them something different, which has happened in some of our games, then, then they're mad. And the backlash online is just not worth it. And so we have to understand what their expectation is from us. We have to understand what their expectation is for this style of game. Um, I can use an example for, from Dungeon Siege, uh, which was a game that we came out with. I'm very proud of it. The reviews are not what I wanted, wanted them to be. Um, and they aren't for one particular reason. Um, for a variety of reasons, we had to do multiplayer a certain way. We knew it was not the most way we wanted to do multiplayer. It just wasn't in the cards to do it that way. And we knew the type of person who plays this, plays, this, plays this kind of game wants multiplayer to be a certain way. Call it like, they basically wanted to be like Diablo style multiplayer, like that one type stuff. Take your character, jump into another game, get some <coughs> game. It just, like I said, just wasn't in the cards. And we talked to our publisher. We convinced ourselves to a point that we were still making cool multiplayer, and people would get over this. But well, it is. Um, the press, the press, I mean, literally, we, we, we felt in the end, if we had not included multiplayer, we would have gotten a higher review score, rather than the multiplayer that we did. Um, that's guessing, but uh, the amount of, of, of sort of hate in the, in the reviews and from people like that, just over that topic, um, it was something which we didn't listen to ourselves, uh, and our publisher didn't listen either. Um, because they actually had done, they had done studies that had said no, this needs to be in it, and the press even remarked six months before the game out that it was important to have it in. So, and that really goes to understand what understand what the press wants. It, there's nothing that can stop you from calling up a press guy and goes, "What do you think the next generation of this game should have?" In it? You don't have to, you don't have to go actually go and do it, but that's a way to kind of understand well, what are they thinking, what do they think about this game, and actually have a conversation about it. And, some, and the next thing that we started doing a lot is a lot of usability testing. So we put a usability lab in our office, and what we try to do is understand is, and we, we've done the thing where people play in one room and it's all tied to another room, so the designers can't, can't say, no, don't go that way, uh, to the person who's playing. So they have to actually watch the player play the game really dumb in their mind. And so, and then we're sitting there, it's very entertaining watching designers play how people play their own game, uh, just because they're sitting there like, why are they doing that? Why, 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 why? And, and, it's like, and, it, and the first thing is like they're mad at half the person. They're mad at the player. It's the player's fault. And, and they really have to get over it. And they get over it and they understand. Um, and I have a, a great example of usability testing from all the way back from Fallout 1. The first usability test we did on Fallout 1, um, if any of you know Fallout, there's a stim pack, which is a standard human device, right? So the first piece of art for the stim pack, it looked more like a laser gun. It was, like a, it was like a syringe, but with a trigger. And so every single person, when they opened their first chest, they, they grabbed it. They then, they then equipped it, and they went up to a, a mole rat, and they tried to, they tried to like poke or shoot the mole rat with stim pack. And we would never, ever, ever have seen or known that if we had not tested it. Because to us, that was the stim pack. And so, and so we, from there, we've always tried to, whenever possible, do usability testing. Um, now, and the next thing is I'm a little biased because I started in QA, but QA departments, of course, they can be angry. They can have a lot of ideas about a lot of stuff. They can have, uh, they have a lot of things to say all the time. But that, does, that doesn't mean they shouldn't be listened to. And they're going to be wrong a lot of time. But a lot of times what I say about when people are complaining about it, is that, you know, what you have to look at is what they're talking about is the symptom, figure out the disease. In other words, so they don't like something. Okay, well then figure out what is, what is the core of why they don't like it. There really might be a problem right under, under there somewhere that is really causing that and maybe causing that. So their opinion absolutely matters. Uh, alpha is a wall of quality. I don't know why I thought that picture was funny. But anyway, um, I'm sure that person is driving the car. But, uh, so, uh, I started, we started really thinking about this three or four years ago, and we were like, okay, so we're City, we've made some good games, uh, we've had some challenges, we've had, uh, you know, sort of opinion of our games are not the truth, um, our games have been buggy, um, we've had some successes and we had some failures. Why do the, the, the people on that list, the 3 Bs, Viral, the Desert, why do they seem to be more successful? Um, now, part of that you can say, well, they're really, they're really publishers uh, for the most part, or they work not as wrong in putting it. Um, they have the resources to do things the way that they want to do them. 
Um, and, and, but I thought that was, that was an unfair thing to just to stop the sort of intellectual thought process at that point. And really what I came up with is those studios get to spend all the time in the world in alpha. You know, some, some more, some less, but they get the game in essence done, and then they can spend a ton of time in alpha making it better. And to me, that is what alpha time is all about. That's why, you, that's why we have started working very hard to start really hitting our alpha days. Uh, it's because if we hit our alpha date, then that next three or four months is going to be all about just making the game better. We're not trying to put money in. We're not trying to put more in the game at that point in time. We're just making it better. And that really leads to the fact that there's, that makes, that there's two important dates when it comes to making a game in my mind. It's entering production and it's hitting your alpha. You have to, you have to enter your production, you have to enter production cleanly with all the features that you need. Um, otherwise, the team is not going to be efficient. In other words, they're, not, they're, they're going to be making the game without all the parts. And that just makes them not as efficient as they could be. You have to hit, we have to hit our alpha, uh, we have to hit our alpha and we, very cleanly, because if we don't, we're still making stuff. We're not making the game better, we're still making stuff. And so we've had to be very careful, we have to continually really focus on making sure that we hit our alpha. Um, now, how we've done that in a lot of ways, um, and this can be scary, and people, there's sometimes revolts and angry people, but we, we shrink production. So when we were looking at Dungeon Siege in, in particular, um, we shrunk production to five to five and a half, six months. And the minute we, and we kind of did that at the beginning of production. And the initial thing was we're crazy, we're nuts, we're retarded, lots of other things, some things that were a lot less nice that were being said about us. Um, there was yelling, there was screaming. Um, and once everybody kind of calmed down, and we, we said, we're not asking you to make nine months of production in six months. We're asking you to make six months of production, which meant immediately we went from uh, the size of the game we we, 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 sell. we went from 160 cells uh, to 100 cells. And that's how we then, so the product was scoped down so we could finish it in that time so that then we could use the alpha time to make the game that It worked okay. I think Dungeon Seed could have been a better game if we could have cleanly hit our alpha. Um, but I think we did, we did a better job. And, and ultimately, the way that I have to take this from one of our tool producers, tool programmers, uh, which is this idea that um, is this idea of development debt. And that's the idea of not finishing something and moving on to something else. And we do this all the time. It's actually our mistake in Fallout New Vegas, which is that we got areas done. And by done is they were in the build. You can play the critical path. The critical path didn't crash. And that was out of it. So the game was playable, but no loot pass, no balance pass, no, no secondary quests, no, um, no fluff dialogues, no this, no that. The puzzles didn't necessarily work. And we moved on as if all that stuff was working. And so all we did is we just created just this one of work like some stuff that's on your credit card. It's going to have to get paid off. And the problem is that you, then what you do is you have to pay that off, or what we found, we have to then pay off, paid off in alpha. And then it's, again, that's not making the game better, it's just finishing work. And so we really try to be work really hard at being honest with ourselves about the fact that, um, it, about, honest with ourselves, that we, um, honest with ourselves that when we move on, we, we, we know what we still have to do and what is left to do and we schedule it then. We don't say, oh, it'll get, it'll just get done better. <coughs> um, and this is real quick, I have some high school slides on this, but, um, I think what's really helped us is, is really understanding that big products have a lot of communication problems. And that I think it's something everybody knows, but how we've solved that in particular uh, is by focus, by using SharePoint. Um, and I, and I'm not, I don't want to be sort of a, a, a salesman for Microsoft or anything like that, uh, but SharePoint's worked really well for us. Uh, it let, we have all the information on the company, we have HR, we do trouble tickets um, for IT, uh, every product has their own product site plus blog, uh, and everybody blogs two, three times a week, which again helps communication. Uh, tools programmers blog on the sites when they add some, some cool little tool. Uh, and ultimately what that means is all information about, about a product is in one place, and it's even version control. And so, and so that allows us to send links around an email rather than sending documents around. So everybody always has a has link. But it also, what we've also started using is use it as, eventually we have to transfer over to our publishers, 
bug tracker, but we use that also as we also use it for bug tracking. And what it made it allow us to do is kind of integrate bug tracker. What I mean by that is we actually wrote product, we wrote a program that if you're playing on your 360, we have sort of we have like a little console interface, you press bug, and it takes a screenshot from the 360, it takes all this information 360 where you are in the game, um, uh, a little like a command line on how the how the program works, can get immediately there, and a bunch of other information, and sends it all into SharePoint as a bug. And so that has allowed us again, if someone is looking, so if a programmer is looking for how is this feature supposed to work, there's the bug, and they can also search on SharePoint to find the depth design document for the feature. So it's, it's really helped us, and you know, and some of the other side effects of it, um, we do we have our own approval process in there as well, so we can basically use a very simple sort of uh, work process uh, when it comes to being SharePoint of uh, these big kids can improve our. And lastly, uh, which I think has really helped us, is when it comes to publisher access. We can have our publisher have full access to the entire SharePoint site of a product. Which means there is never like we only the only thing we, we, we don't have to look at is we have we do have one folder on the site that has sort of our the, the real not the bandwidth but but the real budgets with the real salaries and all that kind of stuff and that and they don't have access to that but they have access to everything else they see where we are with our tasks they see who they are with our issues they have all the latest art. they have all the latest documents and and one thing our internal producers have really appreciated that because the, our external producers don't have to call them. They basically just go up and get the latest stuff. And so it just from an overall organizational perspective, uh, it's, it's worked out really well for us. So the very last thing, oh, sorry, no, not the last thing. This is just a little bit of SharePoint. Uh, so this is how we've set it up. Um, this, is sort of, this is the team site. Uh, what it does is a link to the latest build. Uh, up here are a bunch of tutorials about how to use the engine. This is all the latest improved artwork. This here is actually sort of publisher things that were actually assigned to me. Uh, with things our publishers want information about like localization or demos. Um, up here is actually we'll list out tasks and bugs. Uh, because if someone logs into SharePoint and takes their, their Windows login, and what we do is we filter all of these lists. When I go to SharePoint, it just shows my stuff. And so we have one window, and down here is actually a list of basically all the different kind of documents and things that you know, sign documents, hard documents, things like that. What we also can use, sorry, this is not very good. But um, the idea is here, what this is all is, is we also have lists instead of having Excel documents. These are actually lists of all sort of different cells in Dungeon C3 and their status for lighting and all things like that. And by having them as a list, we can also initiate things like when something is when something is goes from one stage to another stage, it can it can basically initiate an email out. And so instead of that, instead of having that. So anyway, the real last thing. So, and this is going to maybe seem silly or corny or something like that. But we do say this all the time. Oh, in the end, what matters is that some kid or some person is going to go spend 60 bucks at Best Buy or off Amazon or something like that to buy our game. And if we don't think the decision that we're making is beneficial to them or, or is meaningful to them or will make their game experience better, then why, then why are we making it? And, and that's ultimately, I think, the thing that we always try to come back to and we always challenge ourselves with. If in the end it's a player and they're giving us their money and we need to be, uh, we need to be responsible.